ready? We're going to go ahead and start the Basia Society of Rawling right now. Uh, are we on? Yes, we're on. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, please make sure that you uh, do so after the meeting. You know, Basia had some great quotes, and it was well, there's one that he made which is directly relevant to education. And he said that, uh, you know, every time people object to uh, things that are being done by the government, the socialists conclude that we, those who object, conclude that um, we want to do all the way or we don't like anything. He said, if we disapprove of state education, and then the socialists say that we're opposed to any education, which of course is absurd. And that was part of the beauty of Basia, was he was able to tongue in cheek explain economics to people when they would take absurd positions. Hi, my name is Brad Taylor. I'm the director of the Basia Society of Raleigh. Um, we're a branch of the American Institute for Economic Research. Today is September 13th, 2023. And uh, we are named for Frederick Bastiat. He was an economist in the 19th century. He influenced uh, Milton Friedman and other people, and he was, uh, he was uh, a devotee of Adam Smith. So we promote capitalism, free markets, entrepreneurship, and today we're co-sponsoring an event with the America's Future, and Chris West, who's the president, uh, is going to introduce himself after I say just a couple more words. Uh, he's gonna explain a little bit about what America's Future is about. Our speaker today is Brian Jones. He's a uh, parents for he's the vice president of Parents for National Freedom North Carolina, and he was uh, recommended to us by Jenna Robinson, who is with the James G. Martin Foundation. She's one she's one of the people on our steering committee. Really love Jenna. She's fantastic. She couldn't be here tonight. But she's very much in demand, and she's talking to somebody in Washington D.C. or what what have you. Um, and I'm not gonna be able to do ju justice to Brian's background completely, but I'm gonna give it a little bit of a, a shot here. Basically, he leads the organization's communications and messaging across all platforms. He heads up the media outreach efforts, and he works to develop and advance relationships with key so stakeholders across the state. I'm gonna let him explain more about what that is and what his organization is about. Chris, you wanna come up and say a couple of words? Hey there, good evening, afternoon, whatever you're going to call this in between space. Um, it's great to be here tonight. I want to share a couple words about America's future and what we have going on in Raleigh. Um, we are a nationally based group. We were founded about 30 years ago in D.C. with the goal of getting young people involved in their communities and giving young people a voice and creating space where they can come together, have deep, meaningful conversations, and figure out that ultimately liberty wins. Um, that liberty makes sense as a value, The civic engagement and civic responsibility are important and not only just important for us personally or formationally, but for our whole society they're necessary in order for us to thrive. Um, so here in Raleigh we have a couple things going on. Like you can see we do events like this. We partner with amazing organizations like Bastiat that have all this cool stuff going on. Um, we also host a series of listening sessions throughout the year with different groups um, around specific issue areas. So we just hosted um, a big meeting with 20 faith leaders and Raleigh City Council members and the Lieutenant Governor's Office around issues of affordable housing. We're hosting um, a partnership with Better Angels, uh, Braver Angels, whatever they're called now, um, to talk about civic engagement and empowerment, healing the divides that polarization often plagues on young people. Um, and we just want to get involved with whatever we can, wherever young people are involved or interested, whatever topics are relevant. Um, and for some of y'all, y'all are like, this does not apply to me. I'm outside the age of 20 to 40. I'm obviously too young. Um, but it applies to y'all too because for a lot of you, you have children, grandchildren that are in this space, that are in this age group. And you're wondering, where can I plug them in? How can I get them involved? America's Future is awesome. We do a ton of national events as well. We have a national membership program. We do fellowships to help build capacity and community and to connect them with resources that help um, you know, spread our message of civic engagement, empowerment, and liberty at the local level. Thank y'all for having us here tonight. And, um, look forward to connecting with y'all going forward. <laughs> I 
do love uh, any of them where I can have a beer with me at the podium, so I appreciate that. Right, that was awesome. Uh, I am so thrilled to be with you guys tonight. Uh, Jenna and Brad reached out a few months ago and, and talked about uh, having us come and speak about parental school choice and what sort of the landscape of education looks like in our state and obviously just always thrilled to do it. You know, this is one of those issues that is not just a kitchen table issue, but it's like a Dallas chicken and biscuits issue. You know, when you walk into an old place and you see people sort of huddle around solving the world's problems, I think education is one of those issues that's usually kind of right in that conversation. What can we do? What can we do to, to make it better? What can we do to help people? So we're going to talk tonight about what our organization has been doing, what the landscape in North Carolina looks like. I think it's good for us to take some perspective as like, where are all these kids going to school? What options are available? What can we do to expand freedom and educational choice, liberate families, let them tap into their tax dollars to use towards their children's education? We're going to talk about that, and I'm also going to talk about why this is, I think, a really good political issue for political leaders as well to embrace. Uh, but before that, uh, I grew up as a kid, uh, loosely grew up in Goldsboro, North Carolina, which is about an hour and 15 minutes east of here. My dad was a fighter pilot in the United States Air Force, and uh, we got to live there for six years in a row when I was a kid, which in that military life is pretty rare, right, to have that kind of stability for six years um, and when we did that we moved when I was going into the fourth grade and my parents wanted my brothers and I all to attend Catholic school. We were raised Catholic, our family was, and they were able to exercise some school choice for us. It wasn't really until much later in my life and really into this work where I kind of took a pause and thought about the ability to be able to do that and their ability in that moment to be able to do it and not take for granted what it meant for our family to have to sacrifice to be able to put three boys through private education for six years. But then also thinking about those that don't have that kind of opportunity, right? And those that can't afford that. And what it looks like for families like that to be able to have that sort of choice in education. So that was pretty striking. Uh, I went to Appalachia State for college and then worked in television uh, for a while and then ended up working in media and communications and made my way back home to North Carolina in 2016 with the opportunity to be part of the leadership team at Parents for Educational Freedom in North Carolina. And it was a great opportunity for, for me to kind of come home. Uh, and we've got an 11-year-old, a 7-year-old, six we have a middle school you now, which is crazy. I, mean, I know, yeah, Tim, it's, it's, a, it's a whole new world. Um, and they are enrolled in the school of our choice. And it's not lost on me that our family has the ability to do that, but what about many others? So let me tell you just a little bit kind of about what we do as a parental school choice advocacy organization. We're a 501c3 nonprofit, been around since 2005, and we really have the mission to engage, educate, and empower, right? So we engage parents at the grassroots level, which means we have parents all over the state constantly sort of working in community. We educate them about what options are available in our state, and then we empower them to have some choice. And we also educate our legislators about what's available right there. You can see two ladies on the screen right now that are part of that engagement team. The secret sauce to what we really do isn't me, or my friend Drew over here does our communications, or even most of our full-time staff. The secret sauce is a team of 14 of those ladies right there that are called our parent liaison team. And they're spread across the state, and they're doing really incredible work to get to know families and hear them out. Because every family with every student has a different story. Right? We could talk to a family tomorrow that says, I have three kids, one's thriving in public school, one's falling behind, one's doing great as well. So every kid now is often a bit more different. And maybe 20 or 30 years ago, there was a bit more of an idea of we live in this area, we go to these schools, that's kind of it for our options. Well, that doesn't fly anymore, right? The times have changed, choices have changed, and quite frankly, the ability to tailor that education to that individual child has changed. Everybody's got a smartphone here, right? Everybody's got their iPhone or their Samsung if you're an Android person and you green bubble texting. That smartphone has, how, Tim, how many apps are on your smartphone? 70. Seven, <laughs> at least, right? If not more, you have 70, it could be 100. That's choice right there at your fingertips, right? So the importance of our conversation tonight is we've got a diverse age group of folks in this room, which I also think is important because you've got up and coming parents and then you also have grandparents who see this thing from different angles and ultimately want what's best for the student. 
So here's what it looks like from an education standpoint in North Carolina. And I'm interactive, guys, right? So if anybody wants clarity or has a question, like for real, throw a hand up. I don't need to power through all these slides. It's only a two hour presentation. So if you've got something you want to talk about, you want to engage on, right? Throw a hand up and we'll do it. So here's what it looks like in North Carolina right now. It's about 1.8 million kids in K-12 going to school today, kindergarten through 12th grade, right? The vast majority of those go to our traditional public schools to the tune of about 1.4 million, it's about 77%. We also have options in education, public charter schools, private schools, and home schools. Charter, stu charter school students is about 135,000 students. Private school students about 115, homeschool students about 160,000. So the, the interesting shift though that we've seen in North Carolina, really over the last five to 10 years, has been those enrollment numbers changing quite a bit. Where five years ago, 80 to 85% of our students were going to traditional public schools, now it's 77%. And about three years ago, we sort of got over that 80, 20, hump of school uh, choice options for families. And it's because we've advanced those options in our state and we've put some policies around those, which I'll talk about in a minute. One tool that we do offer at PEFNC that's 100% free, that's available for everybody that I'd be remiss if I didn't mention it, is called NC Schools Around Me. So if you've got a young family, or if you're in the middle, or if you're a grandparent, you're like, I would just love to know what's around us. We've created a one-of-a-kind database that has every single K-12 school housed in, traditional, charter, and private. If you go to that website, ncschoolsaroundme.com, you put in your address, and it pops up all of those schools within a 10-mile radius around your house. Traditional, charter, private. For the traditional and the charter schools, it tells you what their, their grade is, right? All of those schools based on their test scores, their growth, and other metrics, they get graded by that, so it tells you if an A, B, C, D, right, kind of school. If it's a private school, we offer what their average tuition is, what kind of financial aid they have. So it's an incredible tool to get a sense as to know what's around you. And it's free, and you can, it's not an app, you download it's just a web address, right? And you go to it, and you, can, and, you can, and you can use it. So as for those, why those numbers have shifted, a bit, right, to where now over 25% of students in North Carolina are attending, well, I guess not 25%, uh, over 20% are now attending sort of schools of choice, right? Here's what kind of the, the shift in educational options in North Carolina has looked like. We've always had public and private schools, right? But what we didn't have was charter schools until 1996. We were on board of charter schools in North Carolina. An interesting thing that they did in 1996 when we brought charter schools to North Carolina. If you're not familiar with the charter model, it's a public school that is governed at the school level. I think it's a really good model because you continue to be able to benefit from state resources, local resources, and some federal resources, but you're governing that school by a board at that school level. Kind of incredible when you think about it, right? And one of the things we'll talk about, one of the issues I perceive with where unfortunately public education has gone is that it's grown so big in so many areas, it's hard to have real impactful control over that specific school. Take Wake County, for example. Wake County on a snow day could look like two different counties. Wake County in a torrential downpour could look like two different counties, right? But to govern countywide and make policies countywide pull the school and that local community sort of out of that equation. Right, so charter schools work by governing themselves at the school level. So in 1996, we established public charter schools. They put a cap on it. We have 100 counties in North Carolina, and when we established public charter schools, they said we can have 100 charter schools, which is a bit strange in the moment, but at least it was some school choice. So between 96 and 2011, that's kind of it, right? There's private schools, there's home schools, public schools, there's charter schools. 2011, there's more momentum building for this idea of parental school choice. And it's amazing that you mentioned Bastiat and Friedman, right? Milton Friedman, probably the grandfather of school choice, kind of as we know it, a thinker on it, and really instituted a lot of knowledge as it relates to this idea of freedom in education. It has an indelible impact on sort of what we do today as it relates to school choice and educational reform specifically. 
So we start building up some momentum. We see some things happening in the states. North Carolina's ready to get in the game. So the first thing we do in 2011 is we get that cap removed on public charter schools, right? It's an arbitrary cap. Yeah, it's school choice, but what if we want more? What if we want more in these areas, right? Demand is only on the rise. That's sort of the first legislative domino to fall in the school choice space here in North Carolina. That same year, we established our first private school choice program, which at the time was a tax credit, and it was for students with special needs and disabilities. A way for families of students with special needs to get some money back into their pockets through a tax credit if they were enrolling their child in a private school to help those needs. Two years later, North Carolina establishes what we call the North Carolina Opportunity Scholarship Program. You might hear this referred to as school vouchers. Vouchers, unfortunately, have some weird negative connotation to it. We always refer to it as a scholarship, which is what it is. And we'll get more into the ideological conversation around what it really does, which is giving back to people what is rightfully theirs, their tax dollars to use towards their child's education. So in 2013, that thing is passed, and everybody loves it. No, it's thrown into courts right away. The left freaks out. Teachers unions hate it. They view it as an attack on public education, as siphoning dollars away from public education, as a flat out, they're trying to ruin public education, which obviously folks in this room probably know to be utterly false. But it's thrown in court right away and deemed unconstitutional. You can't take public money and send it to these private schools, more specifically to these religious private schools. Goes to the court system, and ultimately, the Supreme Court of the great state of North Carolina rules that it indeed is constitutional. They've got every right to be able to do it, uh, and we're good to go. And so by 2015, students are finally now enrolled in private schools of their choice with an opportunity scholarship. At the time, it's means tested, so it's based on a family's income. So when the program was created, it was created to help low income families across our state get equal access to the school of their choice and the scholarship up to $4,200 for their student. So if they met a certain income threshold, they were then eligible to apply for this program, get the scholarship, and head off to the school of their choice. It's quite literally changed lives and saved families since the creation of the program. Yes, sir? Does a student Great question. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. I'm glad you asked because I didn't have any. So the traditional, uh, the average, uh, what we call in our state ADM, average daily membership. How much are we spending on a kid in a traditional public school for the school year, right? The state of North Carolina allocates about seventy-five dollars to $8,000 a year for that kid in that school today. Now, when the opportunity scholarship program was created, it's probably closer to $6,000. Right? So as it sits today, our state allocates between $7,500 $8,000 per student. Now you take federal funding in. So kids in public schools are funded three ways. Federal funding, local funding, state funding. Sure. We estimate, and our folks at Locke probably can back this up, somewhere between eleven dollars to $12,000 a year per kid. It's probably a number that you've heard. So that's about when it's all said and done. So imagine this, my friend, right? This young student now goes with $4,200 to the school of their choice. At the beginning of this program, it was a legitimate cost saver to the state to be able to do that, to the tune of $17 million for some of the kids that were going. So there's a lot of great reasons to support this. First and foremost, just from a freedom standpoint, right? Tax-paying citizens paying into a system they're no longer using to be able to leverage a portion of that, right, to go to their school of their choice makes sense to me and probably to most folks in this room. Coupled with the fact that what we're spending on a student in the traditional school, it's cost saver when it comes to that. Right, Dick? Yeah, you were inviting some questions. So, the, yeah. so as a lawyer, I was thinking, I'm, a, I'm assuming that the OSP program was attacked under the Establishment Clause, and I was wondering if you happen to know the rationale for the uh, state Supreme Court to overrule that it was Well, not. I didn't stay the Holiday Inn Express last night because I live up in the so I can't play lawyer. I mean, essentially, it comes down to the idea that you can't discriminate where those dollars can go based on that parent's choice. It's a freedom issue. And the state Supreme Court decided that. And that's happened in other states. Other states have been through the same fight. And the National Supreme Court has ruled on the side of this over the last few recent years as well. Now, 
The interesting dynamic is shifting political winds as it relates to the way in which our state Supreme Court is voted on. We were in an advantageous position. The last few years we had not been until recently and the state Supreme Court split back into sort of the support the middle. So that's what kind of happens between those years, right? Kids are now on the program. By 2018, we're looking for new ways to help students with special needs. And so North Carolina enacts what we call an education savings account for students with special needs. The word savings account in there is a little bit of a, uh, an interesting trigger, right? It's not like a 529, which maybe some of you have for your students, where we're socking money away so when my kids go off to college, we've got that ready to go, they can draw on you. These really are scholarship dollars that are heading to a school, right, with the family's name attached to it to be able to use. So they can't save it, it doesn't bear any interest. They can roll it over while they're in K-12, but it's not there in perpetuity. It's really for families with students with special needs to be able to afford tuition and all the extra things that come with educating a student with disabilities. Rehabilitation, technology services, things like that. One of the major charges I often hear lodged at like school, like private schools and other things, is they don't have to meet the federal requirements for students with disability. They don't have to include a certain percentage. Right. Could you say more about that? Well, they, they, quite frankly, they don't. Uh, a private school in North Carolina is not legally bound to accept a student with special needs. But you told me earlier that you work at Thales. I hope you don't mind me mentioning that. Yeah, yeah. Thales does not have students with special needs because they say we are not the place to be able to do that. We are not equipped to be able to do that. In fact, we would be doing you a disservice by enrolling your child here. Now, let us point out to you other schools where in which you might be able to get those kind of services. But that's part of, I mean, look, ultimately, I always kind of defer to freedom. I defer to freedom and liberty and what a family thinks is the best fit for them. If that school is not the right environment and won't meet their needs, the family's not going to seek it out. Nobody's going to try to jam their special needs. I shouldn't say that. That's hyperbolic. Yeah. I don't think you would try to jam your special needs child into a school that would tell you we don't have the resources to serve you here. And in fact, I would care to bet many families would tell you that's why they left the public school in the first place because that student was being left behind. So while private schools can operate under different guidelines and regulations than the traditional public schools can, good. Good, they should be able to do that. But it shouldn't mean that taxpaying citizens can't tap back into what is rightfully theirs to then send to the school of their choice in their child's name. And the large issue is, and you'll see this in public discourse, I don't want my tax dollars going to those unaccountable religious private schools. So the left's approach in class warfare, as we're used to on many different issues, is to draw a bit of a line, I don't want my tax dollars, no. We are taking the tax dollars that belong to that individual family and citizen and taxpayer and liberating it for them to be able to use for their child's education. I'll get into it now and then we'll talk a little bit more about where I think we go in the future. Because where we go is this idea that the dollars follow the child, right? The dollars go in the kid's metaphorical backpack and go with it. And here's the tricky part that nobody really wants to talk about. Our state budget, to the tune of $30 billion, God willing, the legislature can come together and pass one here soon. Take a moment of silence for that, please. It's been a long, it's been a long week, it's only Wednesday. 40% of that goes towards education. So this idea that there's not enough resources in our state allocated towards education, I believe is a fallacy. What there is not enough of is the freedom and ability to move those dollars to where they can ultimately serve the individual they are meant to serve. What are educational dollars meant to serve? That's a question that I'm asking all of you fine folks. The student. The student. They're too focused on buildings and adults and this idea of funding students instead of systems is really starting to gain an incredible amount of momentum. So you can say, Brian, what would you love to see happen? I would love to see that 40% of the state budget allocated here for education. And then I'd love to see those 1.8 million kids take their ADM percentage, that 7,500, to whatever model they want. And the traditional public school could pull in the local funding and the federal funding and have those kids and that money there. The charter could do similar. The private schools would have to make up the rest. And I think some homeschool families should be able to get some resources back in their pockets too. So 
you know, my, my, I, I, I'm not comfortable saying we homeschool because I don't do anything. You're the head of school? <laughs> say again? School owner? <laughs> I'm, I'm the accounts payable. Client. That's right. Sure. <laughs> um, I've seen some criticism from the homeschooling community right. on universal school choice, yeah. and I think the concern is once you you go down too far down that road, does that invite government regulation sure. of the sure. home school community? Because sure. right now it is pretty, sure. pretty much hands it, it, It's a, it, I've heard very similar uh, thought, and quite frankly, it's hard for me to argue against that line of thinking. Yeah. The more the, the sort of the government gives, the more the government is going to want to take. So I completely oh, understand. One of the things that we've done as an advocacy organization at the legislature is to ensure that when these programs have been enacted, like the Opportunity Scholarship Program, the level of regulation meets what the schools and the families are comfortable with. There are some private schools across our state that will never, under any circumstances, take an Opportunity Scholarship because they want that level of, where in actuality, the only requirements for the Opportunity Scholarship is conduct the nationally norm test, which I think every private school does already. And then there's a few other requirements on some financial reporting and some end of grade, uh, sort of grade report and some graduation rates. So part of our job and part of our job as advocates and part of our job as an advocacy organization is to ensure that as the legislature gets going and thinking about more ways in which to put the Campbell's nose under the tent, because Republican or Democrat, good, bad, or indifferent, they're all inclined to do that, then we have to work hard to make sure that the needs of the schools and the families and the students are being met when it comes to regulation like that. I could never convince every homeschool family to do it, but what I would think is, boy, if I had a chance to get back some of my tax dollars, maybe that tax credit, I think the tax credit is a great way to go from this standpoint. Our legislature doesn't love those, but something to that effect, where you still continue to do exactly what you're doing now, I mean, right, essentially a homeschool now has to report, show that it's legitimate, that's pretty much it. That's the way it should be. That's the beauty of the program. That's the beauty of the way it works. So this idea that you know if we expand opportunity scholarships with ESAs and homeschool families are able to get some, and now you're going to have to do boom, boom, and boom, our organization would stand up and say, no, we're not going to add any of that in there. It'd be a fight with that. I totally understand. So this idea, right, that you put money in the backpack, money follows the child. Ultimately, we believe that that empowers that family and that student the best way possible. Right now, you've got real sort of empowerment in education. We've got some things that are happening in our state now that are moving us in that direction. This legislative session, we saw two bills introduced that would do just that for families to send their children to private school. There's more work to be, to be done to get to this idea of sort of universal school choice. Universal school choice to me is that method where all students are funded and the dollars go with them, the parents use it towards tuition, right, and then they can go from there. But we've got to at least get heading in that direction. So our legislature this year, Produced two bills, one in the House, one in the Senate, the companion bills, House Bill 823, which passed all the way through the House, Senate Bill 406, which got all the way through all their committees, never passed all the way through, both anticipated to be included in our pending state budget, God willing we get one here soon. And what they'll do is they'll take the current Opportunity Scholarship Program, which right now is capped at families at 200% of the poverty level. So a family of four earning less than $100,000 is eligible to apply for an opportunity scholarship. What these changes to the legislation would do is expand it out so everyone could go get one. And it does it in a pretty interesting and innovative way and it's the only, we're the only state that's proposing doing it this way. Based on your family's income, there's then a sliding scale as to how much you would get to use towards your child's private education if that's what you so choose. Chose, chose, it's good. <laughs> so those families, 200%, right? Uh, free or reduced lunch, earning less than 100,000. Right now, their scholarship is worth about $6,200 a year. A few years ago, my friend, we took that ADM, right, 7,500, and we moved the scholarship from a flat $4,200 to 90% of that. Because 4,200 bucks in 2013 is not 4,200 bucks today. And the longer Joe Biden's in the office, it won't ever be the same. So. So we had to make some of those adjustments, right? So now what we're looking at is, so then families between 200 and 450% of free reduced lunch, which is pretty much everybody on the outside looking in now, they get 40% of ADM, which is about a $4,500 scholarship, and then families in excess 
you get about a $3,000 scholarship. It basically says, regardless of your family's income, if you want to tap into some of those tax dollars, get them back in your pocket, use towards private education, you can do that. That's a long way to go to get to use it wherever you want to be able to use it, but it's getting us heading in that sort of direction. Let me take a quick pause there. That's a lot of details, because I want to talk some politics of it. Yeah, we got it. we're doing good on time. Gerardo, right? Gerard? Uh, Gil. Gil, that's right. I think you got the point. Two questions. One, sure. where are we now with the, with the funding for the Opportunity Scholarships? And now, the numbers coming in for the new budget. Yeah. Where is that going to be? Yeah. Uh, the other, and the second question, the other question is, um, is the, when they when they approved Opportunity Scholarships in 2013, mm -hmm. the, the legislature, was this a law or was it a regulation program right. that, that, that uh, a democratic legislature yeah. can come in yeah. Not have to fund it. Great question. You know, yep. so I don't know how it's set up. Yeah, I'm going to start there, okay. work my way back, and I'll hold on to that first question in case I forget it as this brain gets going. So it was a law, and the beauty of the way in which they created and funded the law was that it was forward funded for 10 years in the beginning, right? So the idea was it's created as law with the idea that if the chambers, because remember, our chambers flipped in 2010 for the first time in like ever. It was a big deal, right? So it was created as law and it was forward funded all the way out to about 2028, right? To ensure that, I mean, look, legislatures are crazy. They could come up with some crazy schemes, I'm sure, but it really was set up to protect the program to be able to do that. Law, forward funded, so that you could then grow the program going forward from there. Okay, your first question. Remind me your first question. Uh, the other question was the, uh, the funding. Where are we now? Yeah, where are we now? Where are we now? Yep. Good. So the very first year, right, 2015, about 1,500 students on the program, very small. Ever since then, it's grown, right? So this school year we just finished, 22, 23, there are about 25,000 students on the program to the tune of $140 million. I think that's about right. Whatever 25,000 students times six grand would be. You guys are pretty good at it. And the way it is currently set up to grow. So let's say we don't do the expansion in House Bill 823 and Senate Bill 46. Let's say, let's say Tim Moore and Phil Berger can't agree on the budget, and we don't, and they maybe they don't happen. It's still currently forward funding out to like 2032. They they grew it even further over the last few years. So the current growth of the program is to add somewhere between three and five thousand students on it, new students every single year. Demand applications and enrollment numbers have only risen. Since the program was created, our friends will, our friends loosely used, will often tell you there's no demand in this program, there's a lack of demand for it. Tens of thousands of families apply for it every single year, right? 25,000 students on the program now. It's doing well, it's meeting the needs of the families that are in there. So if nothing changed today, right, the school year we're entering, we'd anticipate somewhere between 20 and 30,000 students using the program and continue to grow that way in the future. Yes, sir. Can you measure achievements between three models and four models? It's hard. So I'll, I'll, I'll start by saying it's extremely hard to do it because there is no apples to apples way to compare. There's not even really an apples to orange way. The challenge is students in traditional public schools take an end of grade test, a state level test. Now, when I was growing up in North Carolina, and some of you might remember this, North Carolina public school students took nationally normed tests. We didn't do so hot on them. So we pivoted to a state test. So the challenging part is the students in private schools are taking nationally normed tests. So to compare a nationally normed test against a state normed end of grade test, there's just not a comparison point. What we do know is that we look at things like uh, retention rates, re-enrollment, student graduation rates, right? So 90% of the kids in the Opportunity Scholarship Program on average re-enroll with it. So it sh and, and so it shows us that Parent satisfaction is high. We, our organization, conducts parent satisfaction surveys. We're in the middle of getting ready to start with our friends at Locke, a capacity and graduation rate study, because that's one element we have not had that I think is important. And unfortunately, the accountability conversation tends to get so focused on, well, how are these kids doing compared to these kids? That's one method, but there's so many other factors. One of which is, where were these students when they left and came in, and then also, Where's parent, like where are parents on this? Removed from just some test scores is really what parents know is best for their children. 
So when we see 90% of kids re-enroll, that tells us that demand is pretty high. When we see new applicants every year increase, that tells us that demand is high. And when we see enrollment numbers on this program increase every year, that tells us it's pretty high as well. So I think you know part of the challenge for us, and I'll readily admit it, is finding alternative ways other than just how are kids doing on tests versus each other to have a more robust conversation around what we call sort of accountability in this in this method. And what should be lost in that is parents having a voice as to, let me tell you why we left in the first place. Let me tell you what I've seen happen since then. Let me tell you about how my students changed. There's just a lot of color that gets lost in sort of the black and white of how are kids doing. There was a small sample size done in 2018 where a sample of Opportunity Scholarship students compared to their public school counterparts, same, basically same kids in the different models, the Opportunity Scholarship kids outperformed them when they were able to do a, you actually brought kids in, we had them all take the same test. It's quite a lift. Quite frankly, I don't think it's fair for the students from either side to have to go through something like that. So, uh, and the OSP kids performed uh, a little bit better in that stuff. So we've got one data point in North Carolina on actual testing versus each other, but then I think we also just look as a movement, as our organization, have to do a better job of talking through retention rates, graduation rates, parent satisfaction surveys, capacity studies, things of those nature as, as we continue to grow from that. So let's talk about why I think this is a good political issue, and I'll open up for any other questions we have. Obviously, I, I think I've made our case why I think it's a good policy issue. Everybody know this guy, right? Ronnie Dean, Ron DeSantis. Uh, won a pretty incredible governor's race in Florida, right? Up against Andrew Gillum, hotly contested race. There's not a lot of states that embrace school choice like Florida does. Florida has a pretty incredible school choice program. By the numbers, so I was looking at it today, Florida's I like us to be first in educational freedom, but Florida's kind of crushing it. They have 187,000 students who benefit from sort of a private school choice program like what we have. We're checking in at 25,000, which actually keeps us in the top tier. Arizona's got about 70,000 kids. If you've seen, Arizona went really big on universal school choice in the last year. Uh, Wisconsin, kind of one of the grandfathers of this movement. They've got about 45,000 kids on a program like ours. Ohio's got 67,000. Indiana 45, so we're kind of nearing that. After us at 25,000 and Georgia at 21,000, there's a pretty substantial drop off in the numbers. So even at 25,000 students, North Carolina's doing something well. And in that shift, like I told you before, right, where 23% of our kids are now attending schools of choice, that's pretty incredible. So Ron DeSantis, uh, would be hard to argue he's not one of the, the school choice governors in the whole country, given his stance on it and the support they've had ran on the issue and exit polling when he was elected to be African-American Andrew Gillum, which is an important part of the conversation, showed that over 115,000 African-American moms crossed the aisle and voted for Ron DeSantis for governor. And he won an incredibly close race on this issue with 187,000 students on a school choice program in the great state of Florida. So that's a winning issue for him in a head-to-head -head race that made the difference in his race. It's hard to say that unequivocally, but I believe in his race, parental school choice, and those moms specifically that crossed over made a huge difference for him. And we've done multiple focus groups across our state where we've talked to families of all different races and ethnicities. And when we talk about school choice, the first response is, like, I don't think the Democrats are for it. I mean, they're part party of the working man. And then when you show them Roy Cooper saying the Opportunity Scholarship Program is an expense we should end in our state, and, quote, I felt better eliminating the funding, they've told us, I'll cross over if you don't support my scholarship. Now, did it work against Roy Cooper? No. But has it worked in multiple state legislative races across North Carolina? It for sure has. I saw him go up and then we'll... We'll share some so thanks for coming out and providing all this. Sure. So just more generally, um, did North Carolina do anything to emulate, study, learn from, um, implement the successes of like so Singapore when it comes to like the way that they teach math yeah. is better, and Finland, everybody knows it's yeah. best, and yeah. like Germany, except for gymnasium. So you know, if you're below a certain threshold, you go to vocational track. If you're above a certain threshold, 
you got a tertiary track yep. and you can move between them. So can you comment on I, I, I'll be honest with you, I'd be lying if I, could, if I said I could get too in depth as it relates to educational implementation models, right? But like we use the example of Paris. Paris has basically universal school choice for kids to be able to go where they want, and it seems to be working pretty well. I'll be honest with you, my friend, I, I couldn't get too far into the weeds as to how their educational implementation works uh, related to that. So the conversation I'd be ill-equipped to have. So I can't really answer it very well. Let me give you a few more examples. And uh, people, we got, we got five minutes. Five minutes. People are going to see on the screen, uh, but because they're on my screen, not necessarily an endorsement. It's necessarily not an endorsement. What I'm going to show you is. These are individuals that even in incredibly intense political times, in a purple state with a Democrat governor, running on the issue of school choice were able to craft it. So there's one. Everybody knows our current lieutenant governor. Pretty big on this issue. And here's one that's a little more in the weeds that really kind of speaks to it. As the teachers unions are in the greatest fight of their lives, according to them, to protect public education, Republican Catherine Truitt is elected as the superintendent of public education when school choice has never been more popular in our state. The Supreme Court staring down the potential of being outweighed six to one in opposition to our issue flipped four three and is now five two in favor of school choice. And those down ballot legislative races in Cumberland County with a majority minority population the county that has the largest number of opportunity scholarship recipients, Diane Wheatley, Republican legislator, is able to outperform the governor and win in the district because there's so much school choice in the area. And then even most recently, we used it in a big way uh, in 2020 during our, um, in 2022, uh, during our state Supreme Court elections where we made school choice the predominant issue when we were talking to families because we had a lawsuit pending again against the Opportunity Scholarship Program and had the state Supreme Court been stacked against us, it absolutely would have been pushed that way. And so we educated every school choice Opportunity Scholarship parent about the importance of the balance of that incredibly important uh, institution and it worked as well. So kind of out of time on talking, I'd love to take more questions. Um, we've unpacked a lot, I'm happy to answer what I can, I wish I could talk more about that, but we can kind of go from there. Because we've got till, we've got 15 yeah, minutes. So we have about 12, 12, 12 13 minutes. Yeah. How and I'll be very quick to tell you if I can answer something, because I wouldn't want to embarrass myself. How does the Leandro plan and the decisions and stuff yeah. affect this? So uh, Leandro has very minimal to no real effect as it relates to parental school choice, nor should it. Again, I think I made a pretty good case for why there are enough resources go around. You're talking about... Hold on, what, what is Leandra? So Leandra is a court case that basically mandated the legislature allocate additional funds towards education. It's a court way of telling the state legislature what to do with their spending budget, which is kind of wild. Right? But I just told you that the state spends roughly $14 billion on education. So from my stance, I'll just get ideological for a second. From my stance, it's not a... Let me ask you this. Why do you think parents are making school choice options? You know, what, like, what would be a reason a family would want to leave a public school and go to a private school or leave a charter and go to, like why are they, why are they making these choices? Uh, the one thing that we hear is that I don't agree with the value system right. being taught to my right. kids in the public right. school. So there's, there's right, values? Right. Right. What else? Like what, what, what do you think would be a reason a family would explore their school choice options? Well, the market should tell you Right. See what's available, right? What's out there? Should, you shouldn't be locked in. Should be locked in. What would be another reason why you? Why would I support going on? What's that? Performance. Performance, right? Quality of education. Facilities. Facilities. Safety, right? But rarely would a family be like, I don't think my school has enough money. Right. They might say facilities. So that the tricky, the real, I think the real challenging conversation we have is: Are the resources there? And does this whole system need to be reformed in the way in which those resources are allocated? Yes. Right? So the superintendent of Wake County Public Schools has a two-year severance package for $600,000. Right? She's fired. Two-year severance package, 16000 So is the money there? Yep. Yeah. 
I would argue that the money is there. And I would argue that the money is focused more on adults and buildings. Don't get me wrong, facilities are important, kids need to have air conditioning, buses, and all that, right? But I would argue that the focus is more on the system growing than it is the end user, which is the student. And sort of in closing, unless there's any other questions I'll be happy to take. The beauty of school choice is it ultimately funds students, not systems, and it empowers families to make the choice in that education. And that's where we're headed uh, in North Carolina. What else do we, what else do we have question mark? Yes, ma'am. I was um, working polls for a candidate for the uh, school board, and that was interesting. But the thing that really dismayed me is that when I told people that 50% of our kids in Wayne County did not pass the proficiency exams, they didn't seem to care. Like, yeah. they don't care. <laughs> and that didn't have to do with school choice, but it does have to do with how their schools perform. So I just wonder, yeah. how do we communicate how great this school choice thing is? What's the, what's the, I heard the quote yesterday, the low expectation you know, the bigotry of low expectations or something along those lines. It's a challenging time, that's for sure. Kids got, fell way behind when they didn't get to go to school for two years, right? Thank God schools of choice existed and had the freedom and flexibility to open the doors back up for many families. So part of it is continuing to beat the drum of why these are good programs. And it, it's, a, it's a hard fight. 1.4 million kids across 2,500 schools that system is so big, it's going to fight like hell to defend itself. So that's a big challenge. But the more that families get a taste of this and the more that our organization can exist, our friends at Lock can exist, right? Friends like what Chris are doing, to amplify the voices of families that are changed by this, I think that helps get us in the right direction. And listen, quite frankly, we have been fortunate over the last 13 years, 10 really, to have a legislature that has been behind it and is really started championing it with more gusto over the last few years. It should reach across political lines, and in some states it does, and in North Carolina it has before, but our current governor is so adamantly opposed to this idea of school choice, even though he and his family exercise it themselves, it just, it's, it's presented a, a, a challenge. But the more families get unlocked, the more they get liberated with their choice in education, right? The more that we can continue to do this. And, you can't, un you can't roll back a program now that has 30,000 kids on it. So the more we grow, right, the safer we get, and lives change, and we've got real education reform now. That's a heavy lift, because you're talking about completely changing the way in which students are funded, but that's what it should be. My children's way in the back of the kid. Yes, sir? Just a, a, a point in your presentation when you went over the history, uh -huh. and talking about the history of school choice, you left out, I think, what might be the most important date, and that's 1980, when they made homeschooling legal. Nice. Yeah. Which, which, um, which you look, look at the, the numbers biggest most the biggest number. Look at the numbers. Right, it's a huge, it's a huge number, and there's a reason why. And quite frankly, I think the pandemic probably accelerated a few families. Now, probably solidified for some like ours, <coughs> it's never going to work for us. But I think for a lot, and I, you know, let me pop up like a few minutes, right? You know, yeah. yeah. I think the pandemic was an accelerator as it relates to parental school choice. Because imagine this. Well-intentioned, involved parents still really have no way of knowing everything that's happening when their kid goes off to school. We have a lot going on in our lives. We're juggling a thousand things. And even the most well-intentioned, engaged parent still doesn't know everything. All of a sudden, every kid's at home. <laughs> we see everything happening in their education. We see the way in which it's delivered. We see the way in which our student consumes it. We see the way in which they perform. And I think a lot of parents are like, whoa, this is a problem. Coupled with cultural shifts in where our education system as a whole, not every principal, not every teacher, right? You guys get where I'm coming from. Great principals, great teachers across our state. But it's turned into more of an influence machine than an education machine. So I think all of those culminate in more choice in homeschools, more, more options at our fingertips, a pandemic to open our eyes to a lot of things that were wrong and broken has only accelerated school choice in our state, so I think that helps push us more in that direction, but you're 100% right. And if that environment's the right fit, the more power to them. Because those are great, incredible leaders that are gonna lead our country. Homeschool community is thriving in North Carolina. And maybe if I could 
uh, ask another and I'd be happy to question, question too, which is just that to, to what extent have you heard parents say that ideological indoctrination or what have you that's is, 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 a, is a reason why that's they true. did not want to continue with the public Well, that's program. why our job as advocates for it is to try to just to get to know every family. That's why those parents, I showed those parent liaisons at the beginning, they're the best resource because they can just talk, tell me what's going on with you, right? This idea that learning loss isn't real, well, that was debunked pretty quick, wasn't it? This idea that indoctrination isn't happening, go to any school board meeting now and look at the books that people are bringing in to read in front of those school board meetings. Yeah. That's real. Now, is that the number one issue for every parent? No. Yeah. But if it is a reason why a parent needs to exit one environment for another, we shouldn't be holding them back if they can't afford it. We shouldn't be holding them back to be able to tap into their resources, their tax dollars, giving them back to what is rightfully theirs to be able to do it. And that's a, it's a massive ideological shift to say families should be able to use their tax dollars to go to their child's education and not just pull from their own wallet, especially if you're paying into a system that you're not using. And that's why I might even say, like, don't give them all of it, right? I pay property taxes in Wake County and my kids go to St. Mary Mac. I would love to be able to get to use some of that towards their education. Not last fall. Families aren't asking fall. What you're saying is like, look, let's, hit, let's liberate these dollars and let's put their tax dollars back towards where they're going. Yeah, so this is really more of a comment with maybe the question of, yeah. like, our argument is actually discovering a better way to do it, but the original way that the public school system came to the states was the adopted depression model. So really it's a bit ugly, or maybe put a bit correct, but it's like you're creating drones, you're creating soldiers, you're creating human cattle, you're creating order followers, and something that is lacking, you can see this in higher education, all people getting screened off campus, let alone with like all the fights and violence and just uncivil behavior at you know primary and secondary school. And there's like a lack of discipline, like that is very pervasive. And so like my dad went to Colorado Springs too and went and like and I was like Catholic school. But when you're in like those environments like uniform, it's regimented and it's like it's like feels very creative, um, you know, uh, they're, they're really stifled the creativity, mm -hmm. but maybe that is the best thing to give children. Um, maybe not. Maybe. Listen. Maybe what, 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 is what is that? What does that family think is the right fit? Right. Like I thrived. I personally thrived in a 300 student small Catholic school, grade fourth grade through eighth grade. And then I went to a 585 graduating class public high school in Northern Virginia, and was fine there too. But some kids would absolutely shudder in that environmental shift. So I guess, the, I guess my, my sort of, and it's a great comment, right? You're also talking about a public edu education system that was sort of designed during the industrial age, and like, it's just different now. Everything's different now. And this idea that, you know, you live here, you're gonna go to school, you're like, that just doesn't fly. And the new generation of parents, they gotta be sitting around thinking like, no, I have choice everywhere I go. I wanna walk into the school and be like, what are you gonna do for my student? Not what can we do for you? Like, that's kind of where they're at, so. It's a good comment, it's something to unpack and think about. And, but ultimately, like, look, every time you ask me, I'll say, what is a parent, what's a family think is the right fit for that kid? And then let's do what we can do to get them in that environment. Homeschool, charter, public, private, whatever. And I'll hang for a little bit after. I think he's got a few more beers back there, so we can sit and chat and do all that stuff. Thank Thanks, Brad. Thank really appreciate it. issue is one of the issues that will put North Carolina and other life states on the map and really show people what's possible with uh, just our basic freedoms. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, we have, I, I wanted to let you know about some of the upcoming uh, topics. Uh, next month we have Michael Munger going to be talking about distilling change, reforming the North Carolina ABC system. I'm gonna grab a drink and, and, and watch that. <laughs> uh, I think that's gonna be great. Uh, we have a movie screening of Just the Truth in November. Uh, this is a book by a woman that I got to know by the name of Jen LaGreca. She wrote a novel. Um, it's, it's about the national government trying to set up a uh, election scheme. 
and she wrote this in 2019, just before the pandemic, which is really cool. And then it was made into a movie. Uh, grab some popcorn. We're gonna watch that together, probably in the other room. And also, oh, so it's scary movie night. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's a horror it's horror night. Uh, uh, there's there's a clip on the Bastia Society webpage. It's really really neat. It's like five minutes long. It's a, basically a trailer. And then um, in January we're gonna have uh, Professor Mark McNeely, who's with the UNC Business School, talk about artificial intelligence, capitalism, and humanity. And we're trying to keep it real real relevant. It's really great. Uh, and oh by the way, this marks the second year, uh, second anniversary of the Bastia Society of Raleigh. And uh, <laughs> we didn't know where it was going. We had John Allison was our first, our first speaker. Uh, I'm so pleased that we have such a great uh, following, uh, and we have really kept it kind of, kind of loose. So we let people come. You can come for free a couple times. Uh, Hopefully we get some people who make contributions. We have some people who are sustaining it with longer term uh, memberships. I think we're gonna try to keep it a little bit like that, like a fun cocktail party. But of course we have to, we have to fund it. And uh, so we're gonna, we're gonna try to, in, in January, maybe try to implement a little bit of a, a thing where we have a membership, but we're still not gonna keep you out if you don't pay. Um, but you know, it's like one of those things, you, you come to your friend's party and don't, Bring some beer, you know. After a while, your friends are gonna say, "Hey, dude, you gotta bring some beer." Uh, <laughs> so, you know, we're gonna be looking for some suggestions and put it out there. And uh, uh, really, would really appreciate anybody just letting other people know, social media, that kind of thing. Thank you so much for coming out. Uh, thanks, and have a wonderful day. say is that we, I, I'm, in January, I'd like to try to get somebody who's a membership coordinator who, who could help me to just get people who are coming in the door, keep track of them, and, and follow up and just help, help us do some follow up because we, we just don't want anybody to, to get to fall through the cracks and, and not let them know that we appreciate their uh, interest. Thank you.